Where I say these things and I realize that, you know, corporate folks listening are going to be like, yay, triple bottom line, corporate social responsibility. But really, if you build autonomous and intelligent systems, we are building them to replicate skills. That's what it is. And GDP single bottom line focus is exponential growth. Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 324. Today is Sunday, the 21st of April, 2019. And this interview is with John Havens. John's a master keynote speaker, activist, consultant, and multiple times author, who penned the book, Artificial Intelligence, a concept close to my heart. John is also executive director at the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, as well as a member of the WEF Global Future Council on Human Rights and Technology. In this conversation with John, we discuss his book, the state of AI in business, interesting use cases of artificial intelligence and emotions, as well as how leaders could lead better and bring greater well-being at work. Welcome to the Minter Dialogue podcast, where we discuss branding and all things digital. I am Minter Dial, your host, and you'll find the show notes on my eponymous site, MinterDial.com. Enjoy the show. John Havens. So I'm sure it's something of a surprise that we're on this show together. I reached out to you when I thought that I had written, come up with this brilliant name and uh, the portmanteau of Heartificial. And uh, I realized that you had written, so I read your book, Heartificial Intelligence, and then reached out to you and you were gracious enough to come on the show. You're a, a great harmonica player, let me say it. And um, uh, you're up to wonderful things. So, John, in your own words, how would you describe yourself? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm honored to be on the show. And you did come up with the term, a hard official, right? It just, I'd come up with it earlier. And that happens to me all the time. I'll be like, oh, great idea. This whatever term. And like, I'm like, meme. That's the perfect word for like a little piece of video. And then, you know, you find out someone else has done it. So, anyway, I'm delighted you reached out to me. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, overall, uh, I'm really interested in the intersection of well-being uh, and technology, and we can talk more about that. And then I'm really excited about the work that I am very blessed to do uh, as a consultant with uh, IEEE, the world's largest uh, engineering sort of global uh, body of engineers. Super. So um, let's start with artificial intelligence, because it, it, it does really focus on the same idea, which is this notion of tech and, and this crazy scary, potentially scary world of, of AI. So in, in the writing it, what inspired you to get to write artificial intelligence? Let's start with that. So the inspiration for artificial intelligence, there were two things. One was uh, basically primordial fear uh, and terror in the sense of back in 2014 or 15, when I started researching uh, AI for myself, um, it wasn't anything like killer robots or it was more like a, uh, the nature of how easy it is for humans to sort of give over, and I do this myself, um, uh, permission to devices to sort of take over different aspects of thought of my life. And I thought how easy it would be for people to sort of give up on introspection, give up on personal relationships, and it would be somewhat insidious where there were no necessarily negative, you know, mustache twisting actors in the background. It was more as a human nature to not want to struggle with grief or struggle with challenge. And where all these amazing technologies, it's not really about the technologies, it's about the human side of who we are. How do we save, in one sense, the values uh, of who we want to be so that if we move forward to use these amazing technologies, it's choiceful. So one was fear that we wouldn't be choiceful. Then the second was inspiration. I was doing a series of articles for Mashable and actually looking to see if there was a formal code of ethics for artificial intelligence, because I'm not an engineer, I'm not an ethicist, I'm not a data scientist, which I've said a lot, <laughs> just so people know, but a um, uh, journalist, and, and I can tell you the other things I do with IEEE in, in life, but in this case, I just ask people, like CTOs and entrepreneurs and assuming, you know, engineers, hey, where's the code of ethics? Like page seven of the internet? You know, I was like, where is it? And no one had one. And I am I marveled that this was in, I don't know, 2014 or so. I was like, you know, being somewhat new and ignorant to the space, I'm pretty sure that 
you know, since the 50s, this has been around. Isn't there sort of one common list? And that was then the other inspiration for the book. So when you dug into the ethics piece, do you would you say that you would recommend that companies have someone in charge of ethics? Uh, yes, but I think ethics in the business world, what we've been finding, or I knew this because I used to be at EVP at a top 10 PR firm, is is kind of compliance a lot of times, which either people roll their eyes or their eyes glaze over or they're, they're irritated, which I understand. Whereas the bigger opportunity, having worked in PR, is really about a brand thing, an innovation. Um, the work that we do in one sense is applied ethics, which simply just means having other methodologies and ways to ask questions to really elicit an understanding of people's values. And so it just happens that, you know, utilitarianism, these framings are great ways to ask questions that might seem ethical or moral, um, or, or they may be, but the, the answers to how um, people provide those are based on their cultural biases and backgrounds. And when, when you have methodologies like we recommend with the IEEE work, values-based design, value-sensitive design, um, then especially when you go to marketers or people in the business world, it's a little less intimidating than just saying ethics because ethics, everyone kind of cringes and thinks, oh, you're going to point a finger at me and tell me what I'm doing wrong, which is not our focus. Right, because I mean, ultimately, ethics are a personal subject. I mean, everyone brings their own personal ethics into it, which is why they can feel very much maybe personally approached or attacked. Something you mentioned before, John, which was interesting for me, was this notion that you can sort of give away agency to the devices if you just don't bother le reading the seven pages of small print and so on. And and this you're sort of talking about the toughness of life. And somehow it just made me think of all these devices and everything are, are somewhat designed, obviously, for addiction, but also for convenience. And in that convenience, we're losing touch with playing in the mud and, and the difficulties of life. Is that something you feel that you're fighting as well? Oh, big time. And um, it's, a, it's a challenge where, again, I, I think the choiceful part is what's critical in the sense of things like I often use the example of maps. You know, I don't really have many fond memories of maps actually using them, you know, like being in the car with my wife and being like, took the wrong turn. You know, it's mainly stress. So things like, you know, ways or turn by turn directions stuff is fantastic. And I don't feel any remorse. You know, I'm not like, oh, the days of maps. But the logic of serendipity, you know, you pulled off the side of the road because you got lost and you met somebody. And I think there the point is, is like if someone still wants to use maps, awesome. But I think the more challenging things with agency, first of all, there's a couple of things. One is disclosure, which we can call different words. But if I say to you, hey, do you want to use a map? And you're like, I'm cool with my app here. And especially you understand how the data is used. Like they're not whoever the, the, the app manufacturer is, isn't taking my data and giving it to data brokers or whatever. So that's another level of the disclosure, right? It's not just my choice. And with all these technologies, it's the same thing. It's not just John's decision to not use a map. It's in the thing that I'm using. It's about 99.99% assured that the economic underpinnings of the Internet mean that I will be tracked while I'm doing that. So that's a core part of mine. Our work is to say there's a couple of things that need to have a level set to them uh, because these issues of agency and personal choice must be built on your ability to know that you have access to tools and policy can be put into place so that as you make these choices, you're doing it where there's not this sort of underpinning of tracking that in actual reality is removing your and our agency a writ large. Hmm. So in, in writing Artificial Intelligence, which I enjoyed immensely, as I said, what did you learn from writing it and, and maybe in the publishing and maybe the feedback you got from it? Well, first of all, thanks again for reading it. Seriously, that means a great deal, especially with who you are and your background. And, you know, you're obviously good at naming things. So thank you. Um, um, I think a lot of it was grief. I lost my dad in 2011. And my last book, Hacking Happiness, was straight up dedicated to him because he was a psychiatrist. And so thinking about positive psychology and therapy, which is still a part of artificial intelligence, was there. Um, I think there's a grief. I think there's a mourning 
that we as humans, or at least I as personally, wanted to explore with um, what is it like to lose aspects of yourself where some things are natural, like my kids are getting to the age, my son's 16, fairly soon he'll leave the house, and there's a grieving for that, but it's sort of a melancholy slash joyful grieving versus when something is wrested from you or there's this confusion like I understand why my son's leaving it's going to be hard but it's different than like I don't really understand why my data is being used and who's using it but I guess I'm this fair exchange and I don't know if I'm losing my agency like this whole face that's not how you know trust is built and um a lot of the book was the sort of sense of that and then also was worth. Um, I think a lot of the discussions that happened about autonomy and, and work miss kind of the core element of do people feel like they have worth? And and frankly, the discussions, any of the discussions were like, well, AI or whatever the technological solution is of will mean that we all just get to go to the beach and play around because the robots and AI are going to be doing the hard work. I, I get livid with those discussions and my hand shoots up because I'm like, where are you living? Maybe in certain parts of Europe with medical insurance taken care of, et cetera, maybe that would happen. That's not my reality. And I hate those discussions because they're, sent, they're sort of just ignoring all the hard things and saying kind of, you know, like I love technology, right? I do. And the technology is neither good nor evil, but it's not inert. And is to sort of assume that these solutions will happen and ignoring the fact that people, the work they do gives them a real sense of value and purpose. And so when there's this sort of like blithe conversations about like, don't worry about what you're doing, the robots or whatever will take care of it, you'll be good. It's sort of like, but this is who I am. I love my work. So anyway, long answer except to say that a big part of the book is about saying for myself, but for anybody, let's take the time to understand why we have a feeling of worth and not remove that too quickly before all of the mental and emotional aspects are taken care of along with the economic. Hmm. Well, interestingly, the road to my book on empathy started with grieving as well. I lost my best friend um, at the beginning of the year and then I was like, ooh la la. And then um, how does one, how, how could I have been more empathic in those last few weeks? Because I accompanied him right up until the end. So that's interesting. And this notion of meaningfulness, at least, you know, getting some purpose in our life through work, to the extent that we work, it's sometimes it's a dirty word almost for some people. Right? And, and then others sort of over glorify it and then forget to find the meaning in it. They, they look at just the dollars at the end of the day and they forget their ethics, by the way, along the way of making all those dollars. And somehow I get this feeling that we need to not only add meaningfulness, but e explore the difficulties and challenges of life, including you know, death, rested away from you, and so on. And, and those are actually, so this l lack of convenience and where we're, we're, we're toiling in the soil kind of feeling, and probably values that your father expounded on. Well, first off, let me express uh, my condolences uh, for the loss of your friend. Um, you know, grief... Uh, I don't want to compare grief. It's a very personal, intimate thing. But losing my dad was the hardest thing I've been through. And for me, it was almost exactly to the day, an entire year, where the only uh, kind of thing I can compare it to is like a really hard breakup. Because everywhere I went, I, every movie I watched turned into a dad movie. Every song was Cats in the Cradle. You know, like cats in the cradle, think about your dad. Like it just constant. And, uh, and it was like the fabric of my life that entire year was just wrapped up and I just missed him so terribly. And, um, and it took a year to kind of just go through the physical, visceral grief. Um, and I bring this up because uh, I empathize with you and your friend and in the sense of I don't – you know, uh, it's not like it's fun to go through that grief. Um, and are there ways to avoid it? Sure. There's ritual, there's drugs, you know, but if you're kind of ignoring that sort of core, a level of an emotion in a, in a change in your life, um, 
uh, and this is maybe because my dad was a psychiatrist and my mom's a minister, you're never going to kind of really go through that experience and grow from it. You're just going to kind of avoid it. And I think, um, you know, you'll hear a lot of kind of techno utopian things of like, well, pretty soon people can just go in and alter their brain chemistry so they don't have to go through grief. And this is also like, I don't know, you know, I don't want to deny people trying stuff if it's going to help them. I don't I don't want people to mourn just for the sake of it in one sense. But I was just talking to someone today about how smart I think the um, the Jewish tradition of, sit, of sitting Shiva is, because that whole week, if I have that correct, after someone passes away or like an Irish wake, you know, it's as much for the people who are around than it is for the people who we've lost. And it also then means we can celebrate those that we've lost. And that's part of grief. So um, that's, I think, hopefully answered your question. Yeah, great. And it really speaks to this notion of putting heart where there's artifice. And that, that presumably is how you came up with your word and very much, or at least if not explicitly, it certainly is what I took out of it. So, um, John, you, you work at the IEEE. And and obviously AI is, is a big topic. Uh, how would you describe the state of play in AI in business and uh, from your vantage point? Sure. So I'm delighted to work at IEEE. Technically, I'm a consultant. I always say this as a disclaimer. Anything I talk about here, these are my views, of course, not necessarily IEEE's. Um, one thing for us, so I'm executive director of a program called the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of autonomous and intelligent systems. And I bring that up because the first thing is defining AI. Um, the term itself is very broad. It can mean deep learning, you know, machine learning, any number of things. So we say autonomous and intelligent systems, which A, people then will say, well, what do you mean by autonomous? Understood. But the point is, is it's a, another level of clarity. And then also we, um, in our work for the initiative, have moved away from saying AI because we often feel like the media narrative around the phrase AI has become very much sort of an us versus them people versus, you know, AI. And this has nothing to do with the technology. It's again, I triple is focused on the tagline is advancing technology for humanity. But the, um, I think the danger is to sort of um, unwittingly or for link bait in the case of media where that's the case. And, and all AI ethics people, I'm still in that that bucket of people, even though we don't use the term AI. All of us hate when there's a constant picture of the Terminator in any article. It's like every editor around the world's like, what are you writing about? It's vaguely about AI. Schwarzenegger, put him in there. And um, it's a distraction, and it's also dangerous because it sort of um, keeps that narrative of both science fiction and antagonism Um and again, makes people, I think, especially when this headlines of this AI just beat humans at X, they can write better, they can do this better. And it's like, what is that? How is that supposed to make anybody feel good? You know, the people producing the technology, I think they don't want it framed that way. We don't. Um, so the state of AI, it's uh, uh, there's that point I wanted to make. And then I think the actual technology, when it's used with disclosure and data parity and all that, um, there's some glorious usages of it right now uh, for emotional AI uses, for um, medical uses, tons of uses. So um, I think businesses, however, in general, are realizing how they can bring it into their, their actual workforce. Um, so this the automation issues. And then certainly, um, depending on the vertical, uh, more companies are using more aggressive forms of machine learning right away. I'd be interested to hear what kind of use cases you have heard about, especially in, in emotive, emotive AI or where AI and emotions are, are interplayed. Sure. One of the ones I think is most exciting is with PTSD, with soldiers coming back from um, um, uh, war, war uh, in the sense of uh, my dad, as I've said a couple of times, was a psychiatrist. So. What I what you'll see in the research is the soldiers definitively know that they are talking to a bot. They are instructed this is not a human, but because it looks like a cartoon version of a person, they still have a sort of anthropomorphism with it and, and kind of bond, as it were, and share apparently the most horrible aspects of what they did in, in wartime because they're too ashamed to talk about what they did with the human. 
But from my understanding, it's kind of the floor of therapy, which then gets them to speak to a human next. But I think that's a great example of, okay, emotionally, if um, we all have things that we're so embarrassed about, we kind of want to just speak them almost as a form of meditation or therapy. Uh, great. Uh, Spurge. So, yeah. That's a, that's a great example. Just to bounce back on that. <clears throat> I, I'm not sure if you were, but I did a documentary on the Second World War. And uh, in L.A. a little while ago, I did a screening to at the VA in L.A. and had 40 vets, all with PTSD or some other form of mental health issue. And uh, so I've, I've been putting my nose or my, you know, my fully un embracing what that actually means and, and uh, getting that discussion to happen afterwards, not as an artificial intelligence just as a, a you know a person and uh, try to get stories stories beget stories and help them to speak which mm. is exactly the topic so that's a that's a really recent of course I, I really latch onto that idea do you have any other uh, examples that are interesting yeah there's quite a bit of effective computing stuff happening in car in automobiles hmm. where um, I know affectiva uh, I know the co-founders do some very smart work where they did all this research um, about measuring people's facial expressions and their physiology to see when they start to get sleepy. Um, there's everything from road rage to sleepiness. Uh, the privacy issues, the data issues have to be taken care of well in those examples. I don't mean with affective, I mean in general. But when the data stuff is taken care of, uh, you know, that's going to save lives. You know, you get a little text or maybe over the radio or whatever they might be doing saying like, hey, you're you're manifesting physical expressions of drowsiness. You should pull over. Um, and then the emotional part of it is measuring vocal um, range is actually quite easy and it's somewhat universal, uh, meaning around the world. Apparently, I, I read this somewhere, I think it's like 12 tones that the human voice uses so that in any language, if someone's like, eh, nah, nah, you, you're probably angry, you know, or like whispering. and um, But that sort of measuring that emotive aspect of a voice means also if there's road rage, you know, there can be some kind of counsel. And that's a kind of a robotic or AI-oriented nudging, which means it's different than manipulation because, again, beforehand you have the disclosure to say, if I manifest aspects of road rage, I would like this service that I've paid for that I'm using to tell me, and that will remind me and do X. You know, maybe X is meditation or X is a reminder, but it's kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous mindset, uh, which I actually think is a great idea because if you've opted into it, you know, we have Fitbits for our physical self. We have tons of money apps measuring aspects of our financial life. So emotion, of course, you know, why not have that sort of trusted um, device or people to support you to avoid those situations where you could cause harm to yourself or others. Yeah, so the Euro European Union just passed a law that says by 2025 they're going to require all cars to have devices that can detect when you're becoming sleepy, uh, it may be your, and also to, to reduce your speed limit, by the way, automatically, as well as maybe alcohol and a few other things. So lots of interesting things. Effectiva is, a, is a, um, an initiative I cited in my book as well, for sure. So what would you say when you are maybe from your vantage point with the IEEE, what are the most underrated or overlooked ways that business executives uh, could be working on to drive their business? Well, it's a great question. Um, well, we have a chapter, uh, Ethically Aligned Design is this book. It's 290 pages. We just launched the latest version. It's Creative Commons. We would love if any of your listeners or readers download it. Um, and uh, it's large by design on purpose. Uh, our tagline for our um, marketing campaign is from principles to practice. We list eight general principles in the beginning of the book. But then the, the, the other nine chapters are really about the manifestation of how to instantiate those things. So I bring that up to say there's a great chapter called Classical Ethics in Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. And I think one thing any business should consider, uh, which they may not be doing overtly, is what is the difference between Western and Eastern ethical traditions? And if that's too scary to say to a certain <laughs> – 
CMO or CEO, and I used to work like with Gillette and HP. So I understand like you have to be careful and walk in a room and be like, let's talk about Hegel, you know, um, is, is, uh, is understanding that how you design your products. Uh, and by the way, this is not news to companies that release the same product in multiple regions, that cultural awareness, demographic awareness, um, can just be expanded. Uh, by really understanding the traditions that uh, really kind of form the, 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 the paradigm level lens that people have for their lives. And in general, it's a very general thing. The chapter says it better, but in the West we are kind of individually oriented, which doesn't mean selfish or we don't love our families. It just means we come from a kind of EU human rights person at the center of law mindset whereas in the east it's more communal based or in the global south and ubuntu ethics it's very overtly community oriented where the community sort of comes first and that's where well-being begins and um that chapter i think um is fantastic for companies to read it also because i think it's very different there's so much in the space right now the ai ethics space and by the way that's great when i wrote my book and it came out in 2016 it was hard to find anything about a code of ethics for AI. Now my Google alerts are I don't know, 15 to 20 alerts a day. And, um, you know, where you see principles and they say things like accountability, transparency, explainability, awesome. You know, we have the same principles uh, by and large in our work. But what we have that's unique, which I'm proud of, and it's not that I wrote it because it's a consensus-based group of like 400 people um, that worked in this document over three years. Wow. Uh, the first principle is human rights, uh, which frankly is challenging um, because it's, it's, um, it's specific. Um, every country around the world has human rights, either violations or concerns. Um, but as you'll hear from the human rights advocates that have worked with us, and when you go to any conferences, a lot of times now more and more, AI ethics conferences, guaranteed a human rights lawyer will stand up and say, great conversations, but let's not forget and sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. Human rights is international law, and it forms the basis for moral codes. Um, it's also specific, right? How you interpret human rights, that's a whole other discussion. But if for us a general principle is human rights, it's kind of like a Maslow's hierarchy of well-being structure where let's start with human rights before we start these other discussions because we never want to make it sound like, hey, if we all agree that utilitarianism in this context in this country makes sense, human rights, eh. <laughs> right? So um, that's one thing. And then the second um, principle is uh, what we call data agency, which it sh actually should probably be human agency. But the logic there is um, we have to move to a time where on top of things like GDPR, or the great California legislation that might happen with data, you and I simply have tools, blockchain, smart contracts, whatever it is, where we're always going to be tracked, right? That's a given. That's not going to stop. But we have to have a vehicle tied to an, our identity, meaning where I can prove I'm John, that I can also have my own terms and conditions and be able to share my data with who I want and as much of it as I want. And this might sound like noble and I can soapbox for three hours on the nature of privacy, but it's also clarity. It's simply saying like, you know, if I want to get a loan, my bank only needs a certain amount of information because of GDPR like laws. They don't want to store, you know, all 10,000 of my uh, contact lists anymore. But more importantly, from an agency standpoint and a democracy standpoint, tracking me six ways from Sunday already happening. Thousands of algorithms guaranteed you can know whatever i'm a democrat or i eat certain foods that's a given you don't have to ask me anymore that's like four years ago hmm. but if we want genuine democracy to exist and globally not just democracy but like human agency to exist there has to be a way to say well i know that john actually said x because it came from his trusted smart contract source Otherwise, fake news is the next extension of that is fake us, right? I, I think that's what people don't always think is like fake news. Oh, it's the echo chamber. That's a challenge. I'm like, it's a challenge because especially in augmented and virtual reality, I have to be able to prove I'm me or agency 
not not being hyperbolic, five, 10, 15 years, it's just semantics. Agency is gone. Um, then the third thing, the third principle is well-being, but it's not well-being like mood. It's it's uh, economic well-being, meaning triple bottom line economics, which is people, planet, profit. Because as we build these amazing technologies, um, especially autonomous and intelligent systems, by design, they are supposed to be autonomous or intelligent, air quote, which means um, they can uh, uh, do skills and tasks that we assign to them. Uh, again, air quote, better than we do. But the point is, is that sure, machine learning, uh, certainly from the scale and scope of like law is a great example. Four years ago, I interviewed someone in a law office and I said, let's talk about automation. He's like, well, here's the thing, John. He's like, I want to hire 10 young lawyers um, at 50 grand a pop or whatever it is they would charge coming out of law school. And I'm going to give them, you know, a big room of books and say, look through all this case law and find like the one mention of X. And if I give them 10 hours, I'm lucky if they find two. This machine learning program I just bought, and at the time it was like 250 grand. It's probably like $12 now, you know. Or free. <laughs> or free. He's like, this system can do what ten, the, those 10 people do in two hours with 65% less error, and they find 10 times as, as much, you know, information. So he says, I'm, I'm saving by firing all of them, I'm, or not hiring them, I'm saving half a million dollars. I'm adding a capital investment by buying the software. I'm improving productivity and lowering mistakes. And this is what he said to his credit. He said, like, in terms of being responsible to my shareholders, I have no choice, no legal choice, but to use this technology and not hire those people. And that totally resonated with me because he was a good guy, right? This whole thing about intentions and people are good and they want to keep their workers, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but who cares? <laughs> like, like, great. You're a good person and you're firing people. Great. You know, like I'm not here to be angry at person, but this is where the, the well-being I go, go back to this is my dream. And this is, again, is me, John speaking, but it, it's represented in this principle as well um, for the document is that a CEO will be able to go into her shareholders and say, did we hit our numbers financially? No, we didn't hit our numbers because we had to prioritize our environmental numbers and our people numbers, which could manifest in things like mental health and helping kids avoid suicide or opioid addiction, whatever it is, where I say these things and I realize that, you know, corporate folks listening are going to be like, yay, triple bottom line, corporate social responsibility. But really, if you build autonomous and intelligent systems, we are building them to replicate skills. That's what it is. And GDP single bottom line focus is exponential growth, IPO, move fast, break things. It's breaking us. So that's the other, I, mean, I just want to mention those three principles. Well, at some level, the, the well-being could also suggest under that title that by not having these 10 grunts, lawyers though they may be, search for X over 10 hours, that might actually be a more pleasurable or they may be able to use their brain and, and find other pleasures uh, through their work elsewhere, where that silly sort of drudgery could be allocated to the AI, and, and they're going to, you know, find another way to explore the humanity. It could, you know, it's, and that's where it's a great point. If it's choiceful, great. I think for me, there's an apprenticeship mindset where, like, who knows how many lawyers by not going through all those case law books are missing a core part of their training that they need sure. the answer is i don't know you know mm. it could be that now now they get to skip a whole year of drudgery to your point and get right into courtrooms and be helping people but then we get into the whole thing of you know algorithmic judges and all that and and that's where i think it's the same logic as like you know cars are so electronic these days even if you're kind of a gearhead your car breaks down you're like well i can change my oil but you know i can't i can't reprogram my vcr I can barely change my tires. Yeah, now. exactly. I wanted to go back to another point. You were talking about human rights, and I was just wondering, do you think that what, where, where on Maslow's pyramid is having access to the Internet is a human right? Some people talk about that. Yeah, I know IEEE is doing a lot of great work in that. Like Vince Cerf is leading some amazing work. I think it's the people-centered Internet, another friend, um, uh, she's working on that with with him. I think it's huge. You know, I think it's a public service. It's akin to um, 
I don't want to maybe compare it to water, but almost in one sense, like, and if you only have access through it through certain companies or apps, I think that's really problematic. Um, certainly then uh, net neutrality and all those things come into play. So is should it be a basic uh, human right? I think at this point, if it's if it's not, certainly access to any sort of, depending on where you are in the world, government needs or whatever else is really impossible. Last question, John, for you. Um, the idea of politics, we've sort of flirted on a number of topics just now. Where, how do you think brands should approach inserting politics into their company ethos? And do you mean aligning with a certain party in their country or? Well, not necessarily. I mean, that can be one approach. It can also be to pick an issue or not uh, that they feel is important. So just to see what, you know, how do you... How would you approach that idea if you're running a company and say, well, there's a political topic, it's a hot button, do I or should I participate in the conversation? Yeah, it's a tough call. I mean, obviously, depending on the company and the context, it could be very challenging. Um, and human rights is certainly a very hot button topic, and I understand. I think what I found, and again, I'm speaking so very much as John here, not as I triple E or any of our members, uh, but is I think if we don't talk about it, and at least if a company doesn't have closed door conversations saying, look, we know that X is a hot button topic, but why? Why is it a hot button topic? And then also, at what point is our not talking about it at all? going to be something that causes distrust with our stakeholders or customers. I wrote a book two books ago called Tactical Transparency. There's a way that you can talk about these issues where you're not opening the kimono, releasing IP, um, but also you have to be real. There has to be a sense of senior leadership at a company saying, okay, it's really challenging to talk about, I'm making this up, but um, the Me Too movement, right? because our company has been accused of having a lot of guys act horribly towards women. Um, let's talk about that. And if then you have, you know, you've sort of admitted things uh, maybe that people know, um, but bring about it where you say these are the, this is the first step for us trying to make change because our values that, that we want to honor men and women the same level in our organization. And then you have to then say, well, here's what we're going to do because we've had this conversation and heard this feedback. Here's what we're going to do. And then that thing that you say you're going to do, you actually have to do it. And then if you do it, then the trust barometer can go way up. So I think there the main thing I'd say is some things obviously you can't talk about. I understand. But if you kind of avoid too much, um, then there's not any chance for um, vulnerability intimacy or even um any kind of credibility for a company that's yeah, it's like well silence is a choice and uh, no no action is an action and no vote is a vote and that is a is a wrong vote is <laughs> a poor vote in my opinion so john great uh, thanks for all that it was a lot of fun uh, how can someone track you down connect with you listen to you uh, and or get your books of course well, first of all, such a delight to speak to my heart official brother. I can't <laughs> wait to read your book, and uh, I'm sure what's going to happen, and it will make me laugh, and I'll be happiest for years. People will be like, oh, I loved your book. I'll be like, yeah, it's not my <laughs> book, which would be great. And I look forward to that. Um, uh, my uh, website is my name, so it's J-O-H-N-C-H-A-V-E-N-S, johnchavens.com. I'm uh, John C. Havens on Twitter. I tweet a lot. Um, and then the IEEE work uh, you can find at it's called ethicsinaction.ieee.org and that's e t h i c s i n a c t i o n dot i e e e dot org um, and that's where you can download our paper and find out about the work we're doing. Super. Well, of course, I put those in the show notes. John, thanks for coming on the show. That was great fun. My pleasure. Thanks again. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. Stranger
wrong with challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why 